Hi, everyone. Um, my name's John. I want to make one thing very clear for certain members in the audience. I am not, in fact, Australian. Um, I'm actually from a small, cold to island nation off the coast of Europe called Britain. Uh, I now live in Sydney, which is a very large country. In fact, you can see Britain is, percentage-wise, a very small part of the sort of size of Australia. And the reason why I'm here talking to you today is I have the honor of being one of the core team members for RSpec. So, first off, hands up if you've, used, if you've heard of RSpec. That's a good percentage. Hands up if you use RSpec. Okay, okay, we're going well. Hands up who's heard of version three. Still a good number, good. The marketing is working. <laughs> Hands up if you've used version three. That is actually a good percentage of you, I'm glad. So, why is this important? Why is aspect three important in particular? So, have you all heard of semantic versioning? Hands up again. Good. So we all know that in patch releases, we should only be ever fixing bugs. In minor releases, we can add new features, but we must not make any breaking changes. And we know that in major versions, we get to make those breaking changes. So just, just quickly going over the history of RSpec, because it is actually quite an old and venerable project at this stage. Released in 2005, was RSpec zero versions. So these are the very first sort of minor versions that were, quite frankly, a little bit of a hack. This was bef way before my time on the project, I, way before most people who currently maintain it time on the project, that's been through several sets of maintainers. And it wasn't until 2007, a couple of years later, that RSpec one was released and it became stable, you could use it. People actually tested products and shipped cool stuff. And it took another three years until RSpec 2 was released, which is the version that most of you are probably most familiar with at this point in time. When it was released, we actually reached about 85 different contributors to RSpec at this point. It had most of the features we all know and love. And it was during this time, of course, that Rails 3 came out and RSpec has sort of grown in usage as Rails has grown in usage. So if we fast forward to 2014 now, we actually have, at this point, a couple of hundred contributors have committed stuff to RSpec. And we've finally released version three, which has actually been the product of more than a year's work. So why should you care? The astute among you will have noticed, of course, that this talk title contains a pun. I expect you to care. And even more astute of you will notice that I slipped up and said, should you care? I'm sorry, that was no happy accident. It was, in fact, the product of engineering for this talk. Yeah. It's because it's the most recent, most visible change that we've sort of made, especially around three. It's not the only change that's in three, but it's the one that most people are now actually noticing the expect syntax. If the if this was a blog post, the TLDR of this talk would be that releasing version three is about cleaning house, about removing deprecated things and making painful recommendations. The expect syntax is that one of those painful recommendations. A year or two ago, I would have been happy writing should syntax. I would have been more than happy to write should you care for this talk. Just a quick show of hands, who actually uses the expect syntax? And who uses the should syntax? Hi, Constantine. <laughs> so we all know what the expect syntax looks like. So you generally expect something to match some matcher. And we all know that the should syntax is slightly shorter and we expect some object to should match. The expect syntax is not actually that new. A lot of people refer to it as the new expect syntax. It was actually released in July 2012 in RSpec 2.11. Somehow, that kind of escaped a lot of people's notice. 
And even before that, you could use it to write block expectations. In fact, you had to if you wanted to test that you were raising errors correctly. But in 3. Point, well, X, as we refer to the 3.0 series, um, it becomes the recommended syntax. It now has full equivalence with the should syntax, something that didn't have prior to 3.0. And this talk is about why you should care about that. So just quickly, object.should becomes expect object to matcher. Object.should receive becomes expect object to receive. Object.stub becomes allow to receive. Should receive some vowels. We initially weren't go wasn't going to replace this syntax, but we had people complain. So we have given you receive messages. And we've had a lot of people complaining about should being deprecated. Uh, a fun fact about should being deprecated. It's not. <laughs> What's happened with aspect three is that we've deprecated the usage of should automatically. We are trying to get away from you just assuming everything will always work. It, the big scary warning message it creates forces people to think it's deprecated. I should actually apologize for that. That's something we slipped up on. We didn't think that people would, you know, we kind of assume people would read the message and not just see should deprecated. And it's caused a lot of people to switch to expect, which we like. But what actually made us change this recommendation? The answer to that is monkey patching. Most Rubyists are familiar with this expression. We open a class or a module and we insert some code. This syntax is monkey patching. It's putting should onto every object in the system. And it can go horribly wrong. The original reason for writing the expect syntax was cases like uh, this, which is a proxy object. Uh, when the expect syntax was introduced, this actually would have tried to be tested like this, and it wouldn't work because the way that uh, obs should is monkey patched into kernel overrides on the object, and B fuzzy tries to match against fuzzy question mark. Turns out they go false back to the method missing, and you get an error about the method not actually existing on the object you're proxying to as opposed to on the proxy itself. That bug was fixed when expect was introduced. In preparation for this talk, I had to make sure that this was fixed. And I actually found that 3.0 has a subtle bug whereby we are deprecating um, parts of the predicate matches with private methods. This actually trips up the private method warning. So I'm going to have to fix that later in the conference. And there was also a rather nasty bug surrounding active record where proxy objects for collections would actually remove should and people would complain that oh, I should not defined on my method anymore. And you're like, well, why is that? So realistically, the reason why we're deprecating the usage of automatic should is to get rid of this chap, the evil monkey in the closet. Our drive, as I said, is to, we want to remove as much monkey patching from our spec as possible. And that necessitated a change to our syntax so that we can provide the right aesthetics, so that we can banish the evil monkey from our closet. And that's what the deprecation message is telling you. We're telling you that we want you to tell us when you want us to monkey patch. We want that to eventually be the default. It's not where we are now. Uh, at the moment, monkey patching is still automatically included. But we want it not to be. We want to extract and isolate our code from your code to help you test your code. And this has actually led to one of the other new features in RSpec. So previously, of course, the you know, DSL look starts with a describe and you have context. And that's actually monkey patched into main. It's only monkey patched into main. It's not exposed anywhere else. We go to a lot of effort to try and reduce that surface API. But in RSpec 3, you can now do this, which is a simple fall over change in the top left-hand corner. You can now actually have a completely non-monkey patch mode. You can enable that with the very nice config disable monkey patching. It's not the default because of backwards compatibility. So for the moment, zero monkey patching mode is an opt-in, but we'd really like it to be the default eventually. So part of this philosophy is just trying to keep our stuff out of your way. 
One of the other biggest changes in RSpit 3 surrounds the formatters. They said these are probably the biggest extensions for RSpec. This is what most people will actually add. Just so, and they extend from everything from custom formatters for CI to NANCAP. Yeah. So hands up, if you, who's used a custom formatter? Has anyone written a custom formatter here? That's good. So the new RSpec 3 puts a lot of modularization into the formatter stuff. We're actually now using notification objects to send to formatters, which we weren't before, because we'd like you to be able to write formatters like this. There's no inheritance here. We're not including any modules. This is the purest sort of Poro formatter you can write. All you've got to do is tell RSpec what notifications you expect, and then you receive notification value objects. All of this is documented in our docs, of course, but I just wanted to sort of touch on that because it leads me into the sort of the philosophy of where we're actually trying to take our spec. It's, we're trying to sort of, as I said, isolate all of our code from your code. We're trying to, you know, drive down the various APIs so that they're easier to use. And we're trying to um, help you write better tests, which leads me to my next sort of, this is one of the contentious points in our spec. Does anyone use its? So its in RSpec 3 has been extracted into a separate gem. When I say its, I don't mean the one line syntax. I don't mean it should. And incidentally, this actually isn't monkey patching because we own the context of the spec. We weren't even going to replace this with an expect syntax equivalent until everyone complained. So we made is expected. I guess a bit of feedback from everyone helps make everyone's life easier. But no, when I say it's, I'm talking about the value test. They've always been a bit of a personal style. Some people like them, some people don't. We've taken the decision to extract it into a gem because we don't think it fits with the core philosophy of RSpec as a behavior-driven tool. It's, they tend to lie to you in how they end up documenting themselves. So with a quick example, if you were to have an object and you were to implement this name method like this and you see we've got Bob Jones and the test here is saying its name is expected to equal Bob Jones. This test, the implementation is fine. The problem is with the output. The output of this doc, because it's, on a, because it's literally taking your code and printing it, is a lie. That's not what the name method actually does. It's not, we're always going to return Bob Jones. With a little bit of refactoring, this test becomes something more like this. All I've done is changed the doc string. The implementation of the test is roughly the same. But now, when we run that documentation output, we get compiling first and last. So now the test is expressing the behavior of the test and not what the actual value is. And that's why we've chosen to recommend that RSpec, uh, its method be not used. That's why we've extracted the third gen. You're still welcome to use RSpec, it's still maintained by the core team, but we don't want it to be by default. So now that we're talking about behavior, that segues me nicely into talking about Verified doubles. This is an all new feature for RSpec 3. It was actually mostly ported from Xavier Shea's RSpec Fire. Xavier Shea is now on the core team to help us maintain it. It's awesome. And I'm super excited about these because they're essentially contract tests for free. So just quickly, if you were to write a instance double, this is how you invoke a verified double. This is no different to writing double name values, the same as you would done in RSpec 2. Because in isolation, it doesn't do anything. It's like, okay, sure, you've expressed yourself. But when you load in a definition for that object, RSpec will now say, well, hang on a minute. We know about this object. You've just stubbed out this method, but it doesn't exist. The double will verify that you have actually met the method contract. So when we implement that, it will now pass. The only 
caveat here is that it doesn't actually verify the output against the method output. So because Ruby's dynamic, and it's not gonna check that a string, if, if you've stubbed it to be a string and it actually returns true, it's not gonna go and invoke the method for you because that would be expensive and that would defeat the sort of speed part of using mocks in the first place. So it's not quite true contract testing because it doesn't deal with the sort of type signature, but it does do a pretty good job of making sure you haven't typoed your method names. A common use case is to sort of, you know, have your mocks in your unit tests and then when you load the whole suite for integration, all of your unit tests will then automatically check that the methods exist on the real objects. And we can do this with already existing partial objects too. This will actually pass because even though object doesn't receive other, it's actually, this is an opt-in feature. So that passes straight off the bat. But if I tell it to verify partial doubles, that's the, what we call stubbing on an existing object, it will again fail correctly. So that's all about verifying your behavior. And yeah, that's all about verifying your behavior. Now, most of the other things in ASPA3 are really about cleaning house. As I said, there are four years of development that's happened on two, and for most of those four years, we've been carrying around backwards compatibility for ASPA1. So in ASPA3, we are removing methods like stub, bang, it's always been the same as stub. It's never done anything differently, but we're gonna remove it. Similarly, because we want to reduce confusion, we're removing both stub and mock as ways of creating doubles. If they've always been a test double. We, for some reason, we had three methods for the same thing, so we just removed two of them. We've made sure, we've tried to sort of reduce some confusion, so we now disallow statements like this, uh, which uh, you used to be able to specify that um, you could receive a message at least zero times, which is kind of a confusing English statement. So we try, we've removed that. This one is slightly contentious. You can no longer specify that you can't raise a specific error. Sorry, the inverse. So you can specify that you raise a specific error, but you can't specify you don't raise a specific error. It's so confusing, I'm even getting my tongue tied actually trying to say it. If you want to sort of specify that something doesn't raise a specific error, you're better off rescuing it yourself and expecting the right thing has been raised. But this swallows a lot of bugs, because it's like, well, okay, my code's blown up, it's blown up with an argument error, but I was expecting a record invalid error, and oh well, I guess that failure is not important. So we've removed that. We've removed some of the older aspect sort of integration magic, things like auto test support, because, um, well, most people either use guard or something else, or they don't, and it's kind of something that shouldn't live within the core gem. If, if there's any TextMate fans in the audience, I'm afraid we've removed the TextMate formatter. I'm not sure there's anyone left who uses TextMate. Anyone? One person, wow. <laughs> but one of the, oh, this, this is another contentious one. We've, so as everyone, can everyone read that? Um, that's a before all hook accessing a let. That's now disabled because that is sharing state amongst instances of your tests. And we've disallowed that to try and increase the isolation of tests. So now if you try to do that, um, you'll get a nasty error message. Please read it. It explains how to fix it. And that's a duplicate slide. We've similarly, we've, dis we've disallowed access to double, uh, to partial doubles inside mocks. Sorry, inside before all hooks. Um, the reason for this is again, trying to prevent you from sharing state between tests. If you need to sort of um, do that, then you, we give you a temporary scope. If you need to do some mocking and stubbing so you can do some one-time setup before a sweep, but we don't want those doubles leaking between examples. So uh, if anyone uses those features, I'm sorry, but it's for your own good. <laughs> So all, all of these sort of different things that we've changed and you know, we made it a pain for you and I'm, I'm sorry. So let's talk about upgrading from two to three. So a lot of you said you were using three. How many of you still have projects that are running two? And how many of you have had problems upgrading those suites? So, uh -huh, less hands, good. So we went through the whole process of inventing 299 and then three. 299 is officially the last release in the two series. 
which is designed so that you upgrade to 299, you run that, your suite will still run, it's still fully compatible with 214, but you'll get a ton of warnings telling you what's changed. You fix those warnings, then you can do upgrade to three, and it will run green. Now, that sounds like a pain for some people. So, one marvelous person who is now on the Unspec core team invented Transpec. Who's heard of Transpec? Right, all of the rest of you, go to GitHub when you've got some stable Wi-Fi and look up Transpec. Transpec is an automatic dynamic analysis tool. It runs with your specs and converts all your specs to RSpec3 compatible. You have to be on 299 for it to work properly because it will only translate stuff that works. So if you're running 214 and do Transpec, it'll just update to the latest. But if you're running 299, it'll convert everything into an RSpec3 compatible. So if we look at a quick example, this is a, a random spec on file I made up. We've got a couple of things that are disallowed. We've got the its, we've got, we're using the should syntax, we've got an equals equals operator that's no longer allowed, and a few other bins and pieces. If we run transpec, you get an output similar to this, which is basically run our spec and it's checked that it's all green, and then it's gone, okay, so what if you actually tried to test, and then you get a list of conversions. And it, so it turns our previous example into this, which is the only oddity here is what it's done to um, RSpec its. You'll notice it's rather than including the gem, it's describing length and actually going to the effort. The fact that it can figure that out is magic. It's awesome. It's a little bit strange, but it's awesome. So if you take away one thing from this talk, is that Transpec is awesome and you should all use it. So hopefully that's outlined and clarified some of the decisions we've made behind the things in RSpec3. I'm really keen to avoid cargo culting in our testing culture. I think it's what leads to us to making brittle tests and trying to, avoid then leading to you know, self-aggrandizing blog posts about TDD is dead. I think that's something is to do with lack of understanding of what perhaps we're always doing. So I really encourage you to sort of research the decisions in testing and not just cargo cult. And I just want to say thank you to all for listening. Thank you to every single one of these people for contributing to our spec. And I hope you've enjoyed my talk. I'm, I'm more of a mini test person, but I just wanted to say that I respect your work. <laughs> I have to give Aaron credit for the last minute puns on the before and after talk slides. They were initially introduction and concluding until, Aspect, until he made the pun. I just want to thank the entire Aspect crew for making this transition so easy. It's actually pretty amazing to uh, see how smooth it was from 299 up to 3. I'm glad. Even for a large. Okay. Thank you.